Hello. So, uh, right, there's already a few things. Welcome to 100C empiricists. Um, there's always there are already a few things in the chat. Will the class be recorded? Yes, it will be recorded. Um, okay, someone's in the car. All right. Um, and there's someone here from Calperg um, who's going to make an announcement before I start. Uh, All right, hello everyone. Uh, if you're ready for me to give that announcement, Professor, I can go ahead and start right now. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Professor, and uh, thank you everyone for having me. My name is Abby. I'm a second year astrophysics major and feminist studies major at UC Santa Cruz. And I am an intern and coordinator with CalPERG students. I'm here to tell you about our remote volunteer and internship opportunities to make social change in our community. All right. And I just posted a link in the chat to our petition to accelerate the timeline to 100% renewable energy here in California in the chat. You can start to sign the petition now and check the boxes to get involved if you want to volunteer or intern with us. I'll tell you about us, our priority campaign to protect the environment and ways you can get involved. So CalPERC is a student-run statewide organization that started here at the UCs in the 70s to make social change. We're the group that ran the campaign to get the UCs to commit to 100% clean electricity, a huge victory in the fight against climate change. We also banned plastic bags in California to protect the oceans and helped nearly 10,000 students register to vote for the 2020 election. We're effective because we have 30,000 UC student members who pledge the $10 CalPERG activities fee to support us and give the students in, a voice in politics. This term, we're, lo we're looking to tackle the climate crisis. We're the first generation feeling the impacts of climate change and we're the last ones who can do something to stop it. This past year alone, California experienced record breaking temperatures and wildfires. Over 4 million acres burned and thousands of people were displaced from their homes, while our whole state breathed toxic air. We even had to evacuate campus here at UC Santa Cruz. We need to stop our dependence on dirty energy and switch to 100% clean renewable energy sources. And if this past year tells us anything, it's that we can't wait any longer to reduce our emissions. We need to speed up our transition to 100% clean electricity, and we're calling on state leaders to make that a reality. We have a lot of momentum on this issue. We helped California make a 100% renewable energy committed commitment by 2045. We also won the American Climate Leadership Award for our campaign to get the entire UC system to commit to 100% renewable energy. This past winter quarter, we collected 18,000 student petition signatures, lobbied dozens of officials, and gathered support from VIPs in our community. But we still need to do more to show state leaders that this is urgent, important, and the right step to take. We're going to continue to collect petition signatures, gather video testimonials about folks' experience with climate change, and host the largest climate change conference in the West Coast at the end of April to rally for action. To help, you can volunteer or intern with us. As a volunteer, you can help build visibility on the campaign, collect signatures, as well as personal videos and letters. As an intern, you can take on leadership roles in the campaign to make a bigger impact, like helping organize an aspect of our campaign conference or getting our VIP sign-ons. If that sounds like something you want to help out with, you should fill out the petition in the chat. If you want to volunteer, check the box and we'll update you about campaign actions that you can join. But if you don't want to get involved, but still want to support the, clim the climate campaign and help accelerate our timeline to 100% renewable energy, you should sign the petition so we can show that UCSC students want this change. I'll give everyone a moment to click on the form in the chat and click the thumbs up to let me know if it's working. I'll send it one more time for anyone who's just joining us now. Thank you, Emery. All right, and while you fill those out, I'll tell you a little more about what it's like to get involved with CalPERG. 
In addition to our climate change campaign, we're also working to fight student hunger and make textbooks more affordable. If you're looking for leadership, the best way to get involved is through our remote internship program. It's a great way to learn new skills, build your resume, and make a difference. If you don't have time for an internship, that's okay. There are lots of ways that you can volunteer. You'll have a lot of fun, make a big difference, and it's a great way to get involved in a campus organization and meet new students at UCSC while we're remote. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to working with some of you this term. If you have any questions, let me know in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, now back to our regularly scheduled course, unless there are questions for Abby. Oh, bro. Okay, well, I'm sure uh, if you have questions later, you can get in touch with Calperd. Um, okay, thank you very much for that. So, <laughs> this is uh, look at this, uh, look at this. She's a savage. That's smart. What's that? I'm Phil. <laughs> look at this guy. Afshin. Chat it, bro. Call him out. <laughs> Okay, now I've muted everyone. However, um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself or you can ask me in the text window, the chat window. Let's see. Okay. Um, so, sorry, as I was trying to say, this is philosophy 100C, the empiricist. And uh, I'm Abe Stone. You can call me Abe or Professor Stone. I'm, I'm fine either way. Um, so I'm not planning to go the whole time today because uh, there's no reading to discuss yet. But what I'm going to do is um, go through the syllabus and uh, discuss the course requirements and stuff like that, and then give a brief introduction to what the course will be about. So the first thing to do, therefore, is to see how is it? There we go. That, that's not readable, is it? Um, not really, sorry. That's looking better. Okay, this is the PDF version of the syllabus. Um, the um, there's a link, there's links to both the PDF version and the HTML version here on what, my website. You can see my cursor moving, right? Um, right, I don't know why it's blurry. I could do it this way instead. It's gonna. Now it should be clearer. I hope. Yeah, that's great. And we can see our cursor. Okay. All right. So this is the this is the uh, PDF version of the syllabus. There's a there's links both to this and if you go to this website here. There's, it's basically a list of every course I've ever taught, but this course that I'm teaching now is at the top. And there's links to the HTML and PDF um, versions of the syllabus, also to the YouTube playlist where I'm going to upload the recorded classes, um, and also to the assignments. 
Um, and these are our two TAs, Austin Hunter and Ana Pedroso. Are you guys both here? I don't know. Hope they're here. Okay. Um, well, and let's see. Uh, how to contact me. The best way to contact me is to send me an email. Um, I usually check it pretty regularly, like at least a couple times a day. If there's something, if I'm you're not getting through to me that way, or if there's something urgent, you can try this thing here, notify Abe. Um, it's basically a app that sends a push notification to my phone. So it goes doo doo, and you can send like a short text message that way. Um, that probably won't be necessary, but it used to be more necessary in the days when I used to not check my email enough, but I hope those days are behind me. <laughs> um, okay. Um, course requirements. So, right, I guess I should say to begin with, so there will be live lectures at this time. Um, attendance at lectures is never required in my courses, so it's not required at this live lectures either. Um, however, uh, in this case, you also have the option if you can't or don't want to make the live lecture to watch the recorded lecture. I'll post it um, as soon as I can, usually later the same night. Sometimes it might take until sometime the next day. Um, and uh, um, there's something else I was going to say that slipped my mind. Oh, well. Um, oh, I guess I was just going to say, I do highly recommend that you watch the lecture. And I recommend more, if you can, that you attend the live lecture. I mean, for one thing, you can ask questions, although right now I can't see my chat window. It's another drawback of this. Uh, Nothing new there. Um, for one thing, you can ask questions if you're there live, but also it's just like if no one showed up to the live lecture, I would feel really weird lecturing to no one. So, um, so I encourage you to come if you can. Um, all right, so that's just the background to how the lectures are going to go. And that's not part of the course requirements, because like I said, attendance at lecture is not required, although it's highly encouraged. Um, there will not be live discussion sections. Um, I, uh, I haven't talked to the TAs about this this year, but last year I talked to the TAs before we started teaching this course online and we agreed that live discussion sections probably wouldn't work well. So instead, there's two things that substitute for that. One is that using the discussion tool on Canvas, um, there's required uh, participation in a class discussion. And that's worth 10% of the grade. So the way that's going to work is um, uh, that every Sunday night, the TAs will post a passage from the coming week's reading. And then between that time and Thursday night of that week, everyone should post at least one question about the text and respond to at least one other student's question. And, you know, as I say here, the questions don't have to be complicated. I mean, it should be more just than I don't understand what lock means. Obviously, I, anyone can write that, but, you know, but anything, you know, more specific than that, I don't understand what he means by this word. Does it mean this or does it mean that? Um, um, just a very pretty simple question is fine. And the, and the answers also certainly don't have to be like definitive answers. The answer is X, right? It just has to be something that would uh, contribute to further exploring the issue that the question raises. 
you know, like the example I used of this last year, I don't know if, um, I don't know if this particular conversation ever played out or not, but you might say, well, he uses, I don't know, but he uses that same word here and maybe that's a clue, right? Um, so, uh, and the way this is gonna be graded is um, that, uh, so you're supposed to do this every week, but you're the, not the first week. So that's nine weeks. And then um, you uh, can take two weeks, no questions asked as just, uh, you're not gonna do it that week. So you have to do it seven times basically. That is, you have to ask a question in seven different weeks and answer a question or respond to a question in seven different weeks. And assuming that your question and response are, you know, um, meet that low standard I was just setting, then that will count. And if you have all seven of them, you get an A for that 10% of the grade. So it should be an easy way to get an A for 10% of your grade. If you do it less than seven times, I'll reduce that grade. I don't know exactly. I don't remember what the scale ended up being last year either, but uh, it won't be dra draconian, but uh, enough that, you know, to make it worth your while to actually do this. Um, so um, that's one part of what is supposed to substitute for discussion sections. The other is that the TAs will have office hours uh, to be determined. My office hours are also to be determined, but hopefully those will all be determined soon. Um, uh, and uh, you can feel free to go to my office hours or to either TA's office hours or to all three if you want. Um, okay, oh, and I didn't read this, but like I said, this should be needless to say, um, if you know there's some reason that you can't connect to the discussion tool some week uh, or whatever, let us know about it and we'll figure out uh, how not to penalize you for that. Um, if you participate more than that, like which you might want to do anyway, like maybe you actually would, might find it helpful to discuss things in the course with other students. Um, then, if your grade is on a borderline, that would be uh, grounds for for bumping it up. And there there usually are a fair number of grades near a borderline, so um, um, that's worth thinking about. Um, Okay, I already said that. Here's another link to the YouTube playlist. There also will be links as I put each lecture up individually. There'll be links on the syllabus next to that week of readings to that lecture. Okay, so that's 10% of the grade. Um, the rest of the grade is um, mostly based on, well, the rest of the grade is entirely based on these three things. Um, number one, these metaphysics exercises, I'm really not sure why I called them that to begin with, but now I just keep calling them that, um, which they're, basically what it is, is it's like an online quiz. It's not timed. Um, three multiple choice questions. Um, they will be questions about the reading reading that has already been discussed in lecture. Um, so you can see if we go farther down the syllabus here, um, right here's where the first one is due, Thursday, April 8th. Um, there's, uh, there's 10 of them. Some weeks there's none, some weeks there's two, some weeks there's only one, so, but it's an average of one per week. Um, so each one of them is not worth all that much by itself, but all put together, it's 30% of your grade. So, um, so you should definitely pay attention to it. Even if you don't know the answer, you should guess because there's no penalty for guessing. In the past, uh, students have found these actually pretty difficult. Um, 
I don't mean for them to be that difficult. I'm still working on trying to make them easier. Oh, I see someone has their hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick question, if you don't mind. It's about the mesophysics exercises. Yes, sure. Um, so you had just mentioned like a moment ago that the first one was due on April 8th, but actually looking at the uh, assignments, it actually looks like this Thursday, April 1st is the first one. Should I expect that to be on the lock reading? Wait, the lock where, where does it say Thursday, April 1st? Um, like in my to-do list and on the calendar and in the assignments. I didn't open it because you can only have one shot at doing it. <laughs> um, oh, but it is, uh, unless it someone even be else, up yet. It says that it's due April 1st. Okay. If you want, I can open it right now. No, and let no, 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 I'm not, don't open it now, but um, uh, I haven't even put any up yet. I don't know, it must be, I imported all the ones from last year, but they're not published. They shouldn't be on your to-do list. There's three of them on the to-do list in the really? next week. Yeah, I mean, if you don't upload the assignments, there's not anything to do. The to-do list doesn't really like affect your grade or anything like that, but um, it's more of something that you have to like manually take it off of your calendar as the professor, I think. Okay, I'm sorry. I will, I will try to figure out what's going on with that after lecture and take it off. The first one, as it says in the syllabus, is due Thursday, April 8th. The All syllabus, right. Right. look at the Thank syllabus, you. not at your to-do list. And I'll try to figure out why the to-do list is wrong. Thank yeah, you and also maybe, yeah, just to keep in mind that it does say that the first one is due April 1st. So I suspect it'll probably lock then as well. Um, well, it won't, I mean, I'll, you know, it, it doesn't even well, exist. Yeah. So it can't, there's nothing to lock. <laughs> but I, also, I don't, I don't actually use the Canvas gradebook to calculate the grades. I just download scores and calculate it myself. So, you know, in no way can you automatically get a bad grade for the course because Canvas is screwed up. I wouldn't, don't worry about that, but I'll try to, uh, to fix whatever is confusing about it. Um, okay, thank you for calling that to my attention. I don't know why that's happening, but I'll fix it. Um, uh, something always goes wrong. Okay, getting back to this, it would be better to use the HTML version. And the reason I'm using the PDF version is because I find that when Firefox is running, it overloads my processor. Um, all right. Um, okay, and uh, so these assignments are already up. Um, these two short papers and one longer paper. So the two short papers are, um, I mean, you can see the assignments already. There's links uh, on the syllabus, as you can see here, and uh, and from my courses page, um, you can see the instructions already if you want, um, but basically they're pretty structured assignments. It's not really like an open-ended essay. It's more like, you know, first do this, then do this, then do this. Um, whereas the, you know, I also see something is wrong here. Okay, that shouldn't start in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but anyway, there's one longer paper, six to eight, eight pages, worth 30% of the final grade. Um, and that is an open-ended paper assignment. There's a, a list of suggested topics. Each one of those topics is actually itself pretty open-ended. It includes a lot of different possibilities. Uh, I'll talk more about each of those paper assignments, you know, when it comes closer to the due date. But the one thing I want to um, call attention to right now is that, and this is part of this course being a disciplinary communication course, um, that one week before the final paper is due, a partial draft of it is due. And the partial draft consists of um, an introductory paragraph and a brief outline of the rest of the paper. So, I mean, not that you'll be held to using that paragraph or that outline, 
but it's supposed to prompt you to start thinking about that a little bit in advance and also um, to get a little bit of feedback from a TA and or your fellow students. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly how that feedback pack, feedback part will work this year, but uh, stay tuned for details about that. So, um, so that partial draft part of the assignment is not itself any, it doesn't count for any percentage of the grade, but if you don't do it at all, so if you don't hand it in, or if it is entirely unsatisfactory, that's meant to be an extremely low bar, right? I just mean, you know, like don't hand in gibberish. It has to actually be a paragraph and an outline. If you, if you don't hand it in at all, then um, your grade on your final paper will be reduced by one half step. So therefore you should hand it in. Uh, um, Okay, uh, are there questions about that so far? Will drafts be due for all essays or just the long one? Just the long one. Other questions? Oh, someone has their hand up. Uh, hi, Professor. Hi. Uh, this is Carissa. So I have a question regarding the uh, meeting time with TA. Can I still change it? Because uh... Mine is on Friday. Well, I was just saying there aren't going to be live discussion sections. So that meeting time is not. Oh, OK, okay. I see. <laughs> yeah. Got so it. what's the live discussion sections are going to be replaced by the text discussion using Canvas and, op and office hours um, to be determined when those will be. But. Um, Hopefully we can set them up at times that everyone can make. Actually, last year I did a poll about this. I should probably do that again. Um, okay, other questions? Um, I'm having trouble seeing everything on this screen here at the same time. Okay, I have this FAQ. Um, you might want to look at um, formats to be to, for things to be handed in. So the uh, the assignments are actually if you go to the the Canvas assignment, it will just have it just has a link to my page that has the instructions. So the instructions really are not on the Canvas assignment, but the Canvas assignment is how you hand it in via Canvas. And um, and basically anything that the TAs can easily convert to Microsoft Word. Um, if you make a mistake and you need to resubmit, let me know and I'll let you resubmit it. Um, Uh, oh, and this is an important thing about the metaphysics exercises. So like a week after the metaphysics exercises are due, unfortunately, I have to do this manually and sometimes I forget. I, I've never, I still haven't figured out how to get Canvas to do the right thing automatically. But like a week after the metaphysics exercises due, I'll make the answers and some uh, explanations for the answers publicly available. So obviously you can't hand it in after that because the answers are publicly available. Um, if you hand it in before that, you know, you'll definitely get at least some credit for it. If you can't, if you don't hand it in for a week and it's for some really good reason, like you're sick or whatever, then I'll figure out how to count the others for more or something. But I, you know, I can't accept them after the answers have been announced. Um, and um, this is something I used to not talk about very much, but earlier this year, there was kind of, I had a lot more plagiarism cases than usual in the fall quarter. Um, I don't know if it was partly because of the pandemic or I assume partly because of the pandemic. I don't know. Anyway, just uh, please don't, don't do that um, if you're, not clear what plagiarism is, uh, you can go to this website 
Um, but, you know, I can just tell you, uh, you're not supposed to use the words or ideas of someone else's text without giving it credit. So like, if you just paraphrase it, um, but it's still following their order and using their thoughts and whatever, then, you know, if we detect it, and it, I mean, detect it actually surprisingly often, <laughs> um, the, uh, then, I mean, I guess I should, uh, let me put it this way. Like, as far as I know, no one has ever, who has ever handed in a paper for my assignments has ever failed unless it was because of plagiarism. <laughs> so, you know, if you're trying to decide whether to put a big quote from Wikipedia in quotes and put a footnote, which, you know, might make your paper not great, but you probably won't fail. <laughs> <laughs> or just leave off the quotes in the footnote, you know, just, just put them in, please. It also saves a lot of time and trouble. Um, okay. Um, and all assignments are due by 11.55 p.m. on the due date. Although, as it says right under that, um, I mean, I just, I copied this language from last time I taught this course last spring. Then of course it was much more chaotic than it is now, but I still feel like um, this kind of unusual circumstances, and um, you know, um, will be more flexible than usual about people needing extra time to hand things in or whatever. Um, just uh, uh, as it says in this footnote here, Event. Please, please feel free to contact the instructor, that's me, and or your TA with questions about the substance of the course. On administrative issues, please try your TA first. That's, I mean, I'm just, you know, not like if you ask me first, I'll get really mad or something. I'm just, but, you know, as a favor, try your TA first. <laughs> um, and uh, if, you know, they can't answer the question, they'll get to me. Um, all right, so so in particular, if you need an extension, ask your TA if it's a short extension, they will be able to decide. Um, and if not, they might ask me. All right, um, are there questions about any of the course requirements? How the papers are due, anything like that? Okay. Um, Okay, required texts. So, um, so you can order these texts or get them as eBooks from the Baytree Bookstore or from Amazon or anywhere else. They have the ISBNs here, but also the library has uh, a reserve list. They have multi-user access for all of these text so um, you, you know if you don't mind that being your only access you can do it free. Um, I also have links to um, public domain versions if you want to use those for all of them and there's also LibriVox recordings so LibriVox is a um, what do I call it? <laughs> It's a thing where <laughs> it's a thing where volunteers read public domain texts. Um, so the the quality varies, you know. Usually, though, it's actually surprisingly good. Um, but uh, anyway, if you prefer listening to the text to reading it to reading it, you can do it this way for free. Um, um, Okay, are there any questions about that? All right. Um, is there anything else that I meant to, ooh, uh, this is important and I should have said it about the metaphysics exercises. I started to say it, but I didn't finish. Historically, students have found them very difficult. I don't mean them to be that difficult, but I don't know how to make them easier. I'm trying. So, but what that means is that um, 
people often get very many of them wrong. Um, but uh, the way they're graded is heavily on a curve, right? I mean, I don't actually use a particular distribution, but um, but I you know try to arrange it so that the typical, the most common grades are A minus and B plus. So that often means that if you only get half of them right, you may be getting an A minus, <laughs> right? So I mean, I'm emphasizing that because at, you know. Um, every time I do this, you know, at some point, some students start to panic and say, I'm only getting 50%. Does that mean I'm failing the metaphysics exercises? No, if you're getting 50%, you're probably doing well. And if you're not getting zero, you're probably not failing. <laughs> right? So like in the past, people who only got one right all quarter still got a C. <laughs> so... Um, maybe if I really manage to make them easier, that might shift a little bit, but you could, you should be able to see the statistics on Canvas um, that will let you know where the median is, and that should tell you what you need to know. Um, I can't say in advance because I have to wait till I see the scores come in, you know, exactly what the scale will be, but that's, I mean, It doesn't, it's not something that normally lowers people's grade a lot compared to their grade on the papers. It's usually in the same ballpark as the paper grades. So it's not something you should panic about. Even though I know it's still annoying that it's really hard and you feel like you're guessing and whatever. So I'm trying to make it easier, but don't worry about it from the point of your, of your grade. Okay. Um, readings. Um, so this is supposed to remind me of what I want to say about the readings. One thing is, I always get questions about this. Notice this footnote here, this symbol, if you don't know what it means, this symbol means section. Um, see the symbol, this stands for section, this means sections. And also there's a link here if you are a little rusty on how to read Roman numerals, because <laughs> I give the chapters in Roman numeral form. Um, so uh, what was I gonna remember to say about the reading other than that? Um, oh, I guess just that, oh, I know that, um, so like in some courses, Oh, someone has their hand up? No, maybe not, it went away. So in some courses, the reading and the lectures are kind of parallel, you know, like sometimes in a math course, you can like either read the book or pay attention to the lecture. Um, in some courses, the lectures and the reading kind of supplement each other, you know, like you get one thing from the lecture and you get a different thing from the reading. But in a course like this, the lectures are about the reading. So what I'm actually talking about is the reading. <laughs> so, you know, because uh, the course is about what these people mean, which is not easy to tell. So uh, the idea is to read it and then I'll talk about it. Now, of course, I know that uh, not everyone does the reading um, and uh, I, you know, I'll do my best to be understandable even if you haven't done it, but it might be hard to follow me if you don't. That actually was a comment I got in my emails uh, last year Lectures are hard to follow if you haven't done the reading. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm sorry, they're hard to follow if you haven't done the reading because they're about the reading. Um, so, um, uh, and you know, I mean, it's not the most difficult philosophy reading in the world. It's not Hegel or Heidegger or something, um, but it's it's not easy either. It's you know. Uh, um, you know, philosophy reading is never really easy. So, um, so you should definitely, if you do want to do it, leave time for it. Um, 
Okay. I think that's all the kind of administrative slash um, technical whatever stuff I wanted to say. Are there questions about any of that before I go on to introduce the subject matter of the course? All right. Um, Okay, so um, so this course is called the Empiricists. Um, and oh wait, let me stop the share. And not only stop the share, but also. Oops, that's not right. That's right. Okay. Um, right. So this course is called Empiricists. Um, it goes along with this other course we have called Rationalists. So uh, what does that mean? Um, well, uh, if you think about the history of Western philosophy, actually, let me erase these for now to draw the entire history of Western philosophy. So the history of Western philosophy starts around 500 BC. So if this is zero well there actually is no year zero right that's kind of a bug in our calendar but anyway one uh 500 1000 um so we have one course that's called 100a Ancient philosophy, which covers, I guess, kind of roughly like this period. I don't know exactly uh, what John Bowen goes to these days when he teaches 100A, but um, uh, as far as I recall, he goes up through uh, some Hellenistic philosophy, as, as it's called, from the first century or two AD. Um, and then we have this other course, 100B. So the first, the earliest philosopher that you usually read in 100B is Descartes. Descartes was born in 1596. So, like, around here. This course starts a little bit later than that and goes a little bit farther forward than that, but you can barely see it on the scale of this diagram, right? This is 1596. Locke was born in 1632. Um, and both of these courses go up, you know, roughly until sometime in the 18th century. So this is what's called the early modern period. The early modern period ends, you might think uh, it would be strange for it to have a definite ending date, but in a way it does have a really definite ending date, which is, um, 1781. 1781 is when Immanuel Kant uh, published the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason. That's kind of the dividing line in the history of modern Western philosophy. So before that is early modern, and after that is like later modern. <laughs> um, 
All right. As you can see, however, like most of the history of Western philosophy is this stuff in here. And I mean, this is the way our, our required history sequence is structured, but it's not like an especially strange quirk of this department. It's, um, it's typical of the way um, philosophy, the history of philosophy is taught now and has been taught for a long time. Um, so what, what did happen in this, in this middle part here? Um, well, uh, in that whole middle part there, there were two schools of philosophy that are, were actually very closely related to each other. And one or the other of them was, was dominant for this whole time, essentially. Well, I mean, there was a Renaissance. There are a couple other details here and there, but basically um, you can call them Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism. And the reason I say that they're very closely related to them is that they actually both were pretty dominated by Aristotle. Right, the Neoplatonists uh, who didn't call themselves Neoplatonists, they called themselves Platonists, obviously intended to take a position with Plato against Aristotle, um, but they ended up interpreting Plato in it through the lens of Aristotle. So that even the ways that they thought of Plato as being different from Aristotle were the ways that Aristotle says he's different from Plato. Um, but they also spent a lot of time reading and interpreting Aristotle for its own sake, the Neoplatonists. Um, so, uh, so basically throughout this period, Aristotle was the, the dominant figure in Western philosophy. Everyone was more or less some kind of Aristotelian. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, um, and by the way, I guess in case you don't know, Aristotle himself lived way back here, right? But he wasn't such a dominant figure immediately following his death. Um, it took several centuries for his influence to gather steam. So um, that's why the people that you would read towards the end of 100A, although they certainly know about Aristotle and they certainly have terminology and ideas that come from Aristotle, Aristotle is not yet a dominant figure for them the way he was later. Um, it was really with the beginning of the Neoplatonic school somewhere in this area that in, in this period that's called late antiquity, right? This is late antiquity and this is the Middle Ages. Um, in late antiquity, philosophy was still mostly written in Greek, right? Philosophy was mostly written in Greek essentially for the first thousand years of Western philosophy. There was some written in Latin, but it was mostly in Greek. And then, um, uh, then there was a period called the Dark Ages when nothing much was happening around the sixth century or so. And then philosophy started to pick up again in uh, the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire, it started to pick up again in Greek. Um, but um, kind of the main channel of transmission of Western philosophy was uh, started picked up around the same time in Baghdad and it was in Arabic. Right, so the early Middle Ages, Western philosophy was mostly written in Arabic. And beginning around the 12th or 13th century, it finally started to revive in Western Europe. And then it was written in Latin, right? So we have Greek, Arabic, and Latin, essentially. But um, although they switch from one language to another, they, um, they continue the same conversation about Aristotelian and Neoplatonic ideas. So what does it mean that they're all Aristotelians? It means that um, they all agree that Aristotle is mostly right. 
I mean, not that he's right about everything, but um, um, not that he's right about everything, but uh, there were limited areas where it was known that Aristotle had made a mistake and it was it couldn't be a stupid mistake because it was Aristotle, right? But for the most part, it was agreed that Aristotle was right. The only problem is they didn't under, agree what Aristotle means. Right? So they were constantly arguing with each other about everything, but there's always two levels to the argument. One is, what is the truth, right? What is the true philosophical doctrine? And another is, what does Aristotle's text mean? And they go together because for the most part, you always want to claim that you agree with Aristotle and your opponent doesn't, <laughs> right? So that's what it means that there was an Aristotelian tradition in philosophy for all this period. Not that they all thought the same thing, but that whatever they thought, they used Aristotle's text as a way of, um, they used the interpretation of Aristotle's text as part of the way of developing their doctrine. And then sometime around here, it stops. Now, as I said, it's actually, it's not so simple. It didn't, I mean, unlike 1781, which even that is an oversimplification, of course. Everything I'm saying now is an oversimplification. But, uh, but what I'm about to say now is more of an oversimplification. It's not like Descartes published the, you know, everyone is Aristotelian and then Descartes published the meditations and all of a sudden they weren't. <laughs> um, it's much more complicated than that in both directions. But in a relatively short time, at the same time as a lot of things were ch suddenly changing very rapidly in Europe, um, uh, the important philosophers switched from being Aristotelians to being anti-Aristotelians. So they still agree about something, only now what they agree about is that Aristotle was wrong. <laughs> um, now, I mean, this applies to a lot of different issues, obviously. But there's one that's really important for understanding uh, why we have the courses we have. And again, it's not just us, like why the history of early modern philosophy is structured this way in general. And this is that according to Aristotle, now again, it's not as with almost everything Aristotle says, there's, as I've just shown you, there's centuries of debate over what it means. Right, but in some sense, Aristotle says that we need two different mental powers, um, faculties of the soul, in order to have knowledge. And the two powers or faculties we need are sense and reason. So human beings can't have knowledge except due to the combination of these two faculties, sense and reason. So sense, you know, uh, I'm not gonna try to define them right now, but sense obviously means we find out about the world because it affects our sense organs. Um, we see, hear, smell, etc. Um, but actually touch is probably the most important one as we'll see coming up. Um, but in any case, um, that's one thing we need to have knowledge according to Aristotle and therefore according to Aristotelians. But we also need this other um, active power or faculty of thinking um, our own thoughts based on what the senses bring in. And only with the combination of those two things can we have knowledge. So um, the important early modern philosophers all agree that Aristotle was wrong about this. Now, um, maybe I should say already, this is an issue, issue of what's called epistemology. Right, epistemology, it's a word from Greek 
roots, but it's not an ancient word. It's actually a late 19th century word. Um, so in other words, uh, it's after all the people were reading in this course, um, but it's the word people now use to describe this type, this type of philosophical question. Um, and it, epistemology is, means philosophical questions about knowledge. What, if anything, can we know? And uh, how, how can we know it? Right, so Aristotle thinks we can know a fair number of things. And the way we can know them is by using these two faculties together. And the important early modern philosophers all agree that Aristotle is wrong about this. Should I say that there aren't exceptions to that? Maybe Newton is an exception to that. We don't teach Newton in 100 A, uh, B or 100 C. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, uh, uh, this is something that anti-Aristotelians all agree that Aristotle is wrong about. They all think that we one of these faculties is the basis of all knowledge. And the other one, of course, they know that we have the other one too. But they say that although it helps us in certain ways, um, it is not a source of knowledge. So the only problem is they don't agree which is the one that knowledge that all our knowledge is based on, and which is the other one. If you say that all our knowledge is based on reason, and that sense, although we need it for certain purposes, is not a source of knowledge for us then you're a rationalist. Whereas if you say that all our knowledge is based on sense and reason is um, uh, a tool we use to derive consequences from things that sense has yielded or something like that, but is not a, on its own a source of knowledge, then you're an empiricist. So these early modern philosophers, if you classify them by their views about epistemology, can be divided into these two groups, rationalists who think that it's only reason that we need, um, or it's only reason that we can use to get knowledge, and empiricists who think that it's only sense. Now, um, Why should you um, why should you classify early modern philosophies this way by their opinions about epistemology? I mean, they have opinions about lots of other things too. And as I said, this is hardly their only disagreement with Aristotle. Well, um, the simple answer is, This is the way Kant classified early modern, his, his early modern predecessors. In the part of his works where he talks about epistemology and metaphysics, I'll mention metaphysics in a moment, but it goes together with epistemology. In the part of his works where he dealt with that type of philosophy, um, he um, discusses his predecessors and he classifies them into these two groups. And the reason he does that is because um, he wants to actually bring back a version of the original Aristotelian view that we need both faculties. Right, so Kant comes back to the opinion, of course, he's not, doesn't just go back to being a medieval Aristotelian. It's much more complicated than that. But on this and actually on a number of other issues, he, he tries to bring back a version of the Aristotelian view. Um, so in this case, he tries to bring back a version of the view, view that we need both of these faculties, that we can have no knowledge um, without both of them. And therefore, he classifies his predecessors by which incomplete part of the picture they have. 
Um, and um, it's not a bad classification, actually, I think. It's actually probably a pretty good classification in some ways. But even if it were a bad classification, it would still be really important because it's Kant's classification. And Kant um, was uh, so overwhelmingly influential in what happened afterwards that you know what he says, um, kind of like Aristotle, um, uh, what he says is really important, even if. Uh, even if it doesn't seem right at all, it's still really important. Um, okay, so that's why we have these two um, groups of early modern philosophers, empiricists and rationalists. It's not the only way you could group them, but it's um, uh, not a wrong way to group them, I think. And it's historically and conceptually also an interesting way to group them. And that's the way our courses are structured. So we have rationalists on one side and empiricists on the other. Now, um, Oh, someone says, so the real epistemology isn't sense or reason, it's whether or not the last smart guy agrees with you. Well, um, this actually is an interesting point. Um, in, in 100B, in fact, when I teach that, and I haven't taught it for a while, but I'm signed up to teach it next year, I think. In 100B, I actually spend a fair amount of time discussing um, the rationalist attitude towards texts, uh, textual interpretation and tradition and authority. Um, they, it begins with Descartes radically rejecting the, um, the uh, appeal to authority in philosophy, right? Saying it has no place. You have to, everyone has to start and form their own opinions. And but as you go on through the rationalists, um, the view becomes more well. I mean, the truth is, even Descartes, if you think about what he's doing rather than what he says, it's a lot more nuanced than that. But eventually, like Leibniz has a pretty strong defense of tradition and authority as a source of knowledge, I guess. Um, um, anyway, that's 100B. I'm not going to talk about that much in this course, but um, but it's not a joke. It's I mean, well, it is a joke, but it's also a serious point. Like, what about the role of um, authority as a source of knowledge? Where does that come in? How can these Aristotelians go on for centuries interpreting Aristotle and not admit that also as a source of knowledge, which they don't really? not officially. Um, so anyway, sorry, I was just responding to a remark in the chat that was probably supposed to be a joke. Um, but anyway, so getting back to this, rationalist versus empiricist. Um, so um, So there's kind of a big three names on both sides. Now, um, all six of these big names are men. <laughs> um, it's not true that all philosophers were men in the early modern period. Um, uh, it is true that the philosophers who were um, not men, meaning basically, as far as we know, who were women, right? That is, I don't know of any philosophers in the early modern period who were, let's say, non-binary. <laughs> um, I mean, okay, no, I, I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, I do, but it would take too long. 
<laughs> what questions to raise about it anyway. But in any case, let's say the philosophers who were women um, tended to be neglected. Um, so um, they tend to be neglected means, number one, a lot of them are just being sort of um, re, uh, um, rediscovered is maybe too strong a, a term for it, but anyway, revived as a subject for study um, in the last couple of decades. Um, so, but it also means that, um, like for example, Kant, when he classifies his predecessors, the main people he mentions are all men. He doesn't mention any of his female predecessors. And so the next people who come along and inherit their Jew of history from Kant are, you know, are missing something. So, uh, so you know, that would be one reason to to do away with these big six names and replace them with something else. Obviously, there's some reasons on the other side as well. I mean, if they were the ones who really were not neglected, it's really important to know what they said to understand people who came later. Um, um, so far in this course in 100, See, I have not done anything to disrupt the traditional canon, right? In some of the other courses that I started teaching later, like in 144 that I taught last quarter, I introduced Mary Wollstonecraft and spent a long time on that. Um, maybe someday I'll disrupt these courses as well, but so far, um, uh, so far I haven't. So here are these six big names. Um, I mean, a lot of people who are not women are also left out of these lists. It's somehow been narrowed down to six. On the rationalist side, we have this Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. Like I said, Descartes was born in 1596. Died in 1650. Uh, I won't write the dates down for others, but the reason I want to write the dates down for Descartes is you'll see that when I write the empiricists on the other side, that they're slightly later than the rationalists. So here we have this, this new big empiricists, the people we're reading in this course. Locke, Barclay, and Hume, and Locke's dates are 1632 to, I believe, 1704. Yeah. And Leibniz died in 1716, whereas Hume died in 1776. So this starts later and ends later. And I mean, in fact, if you were to, to draw this diagram a little bit more accurately, I think you might put Descartes kind of in the middle here. I mean, he is a rationalist by the definition I just gave, but it's really both Locke and Spinoza are kind of um, followers of slash responses to Descartes. Descartes comes before both of them. Um, so we will see Locke engaged with Descartes, sometimes explicitly, but a lot of times not by name. You have to um, know what Descartes said to realize that Locke is arguing with him. Um, Okay, so what other things do I still want to talk about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess, right, so there's, um, so like, 
these are the people we're going to be with. Now I think I've kind of finished putting them in context. <laughs> um, except, well, I haven't finished because there's two more, like, um, uh, I want to go at this from two other directions. So the first one is this. So like I said, these people are being classified into rationalists and empiricists on the basis of their epistemology. Yeah, maybe I should actually. Yeah. Okay. That might be confusing to you. epistemology and metaphysics. So epistemology, as I already said, is you know philosophy about knowledge, about the extent and origin of human knowledge. Um, metaphysics, the term metaphysics, which is an ancient term, um, although it doesn't go all the way back to Aristotle, it is an ancient term. It's meant a lot of different things over the years. Um, what it basically means now, and what I'm going to use it to mean for in this discussion is um, basically the study of what kind of things exist, ontology, and some related issues, fundamental things like how it's possible for one thing to cause another. Um, right? That's the general area of problems people call metaphysics. Now, um, there obviously should be some relationship between epistemology and metaphysics. I mean, if metaphysics is where, is the part of philosophy where you want to know the most general and fundamental truths about the world, um, if you wanna know what kind of truths you can know, period, and how, then you have to do epistemology. So the epistemology and the metaphysics have to fit together. That is, on the one hand, if I claim that X, Y, and Z kind of things exist, for example, that's my metaphysics, my epistemology had better be up to explaining how I could know that. So, um, um, but on the other hand, if I claim I can know certain types of things, let's say using my sense organs, then my metaphysics ought to be able to explain how there can be such thing as sense organs and how other bodies can interact with them and with minds, whatever they are and so forth, right? So epistemology and metaphysics have to fit together or they should fit together in a certain way. Sometimes one of them comes first and sometimes the other comes first. In this period, for the most part, the epistemology comes first, right? So that these philosophers mostly start by asking, okay, what can I possibly know about the world? And then from that, they go on to reach conclusions about what I can say the world is like, what kind of things I could know that it has in it, and so forth. Um, but still, I mean, they have both and they always go together or they, like I said, they should fit together. Um, on the other hand, there's also completely different kinds of philosophical problems. And the main other kind of philosophical problem is the kind that comes up in ethics and politics. I really don't have room left here on this board to write more stuff. What am I going to do? You don't have to write a few things. Epistemology and metaphysics. Versus ethics and politics. So here the question is like what we're aiming at is truth. 
right? Like we want to know what we can know and we want to know what is actually true. Whereas here, what we're aiming at is action, right? We want to know what is the right thing to do, either in terms of as individuals, that's basically ethics, or at least this is one way of understanding the difference between ethics and politics, or as society, which would be politics or political philosophy, right? Those are a question not about what is true and false, but about what is right or wrong to do. So this is um, this side of philosophy is um, often called theoretical or speculative philosophy, and this side is called practical philosophy. And I'm introducing those terms now because I, they're going to come up again as the course goes on. I usually end up introducing them in basically every course. <laughs> um, so uh, this is an ancient uh, division of philosophy into two main parts. It's possibly already in Plato, definitely in, in these terms is in Aristotle. Um, and uh, it's important not to be misled by what any of these words ordinarily mean in English now, right? It's technical terms in this sense. So theoretical, the difference between theory and practice here is not the difference between like kind of um, theories that are formed without good information about the world versus theories that are formed with good information about the world. Right, like so an example, this is the way we often use the terms theory and practice now. I always use this example for some reason. Like in theory, it might be good to build a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean, but in practice, it wouldn't work out. This is the way, that's, a, that's an example of how we would use that contrast in ordinary English, theory versus practice. What that really means is just that the first theory, according to which it would be good to build a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean was not a very good theory, right? It was a theory that didn't take into account things like how much it would cost, how dangerous it would be to cross it, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so, I mean, uh, um, that's an important contrast to draw in certain cases, but it's not a contrast between two fundamental fundamentally different kinds of philosophical questions. The, the contrast that's being drawn here between theoretical and practical is a question of, um, like if I go back to the same case, you might say the theoretical question, a theoretical question would be how much would it cost to build a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean? A practical question would be, should we build one? <laughs> So the two questions aren't unrelated, right? I mean, if you want to answer the practical question, you might need to know the answer to the theoretical question, but they're not the same question either, right? Like we could agree how much it would cost, but one of us could still think we should build it and the other one should think we shouldn't. It's, they're different questions. Um, so, when we divide 100B and, but, and speculative, so speculative here is just the Latin equivalent of the Greek term theoretical. It doesn't mean like guessing or something like that. It just means about truth, about trying to find out the truth rather than about trying to decide what to do. And this is the term that Locke will mostly use when he makes the concept. So that's why I'm putting a big circle around it. We'll mostly talk about the distinction between speculative and practical. You'll see that right away in book one of the essay concerning human understanding, where he talks about speculative principles and practical principles. So in dividing 100B and 100C, or in dividing early modern philosophy into rationalists and empiricists, we're dividing them by this criteria, by their theoretical views. But these people also all had ethical and political views. 
right? There wasn't, there's none of them that were only interested in epistemology and metaphysics and not ethics and politics. They all did both. And if you were to divide them based on their ethical and political views, it wouldn't come out the same way. So like when I taught 144, well, first two years ago, and then again, last quarter, an early modern political philosophy, you know, the people, first of all, um, um, the only person who's on, who is in both of these courses was Locke. Um, and the others were uh, Hobbes, Rousseau, and Wollstonecraft. So a completely different association of names. Um, so basically 100B and 100C therefore are about early modern theoretical philosophy. Because that's the way the structure is set up. It's classifying based on that. Um, Nevertheless, like I said, like these people were not interested in only one, and they didn't think that these were topics to be dealt with separately by separate specialists. They thought that philosophers were uh, responsible for both of these things. Um, and Kant thought that, and Hegel thought that, and um, Basically, everyone thought that until very recently. It's important to realize how recently philosophy has become specialized the way it is now. In this period, it was not. So, um, so therefore, although basically the topic of the course is the epistemology and metaphysics of these people, when their ethical and political views come up, I'm going to talk about those two. Um, that's going to be. So some years when I teach this, we end with Hume's second inquiry, which is all about ethics. This year I decided to do the dialogues concerning natural religion instead, which is kind of, um, which I've done also in previous years, which is kind of a mixture of both, right? Because, you know, well, because that's what religion has to do somehow with the question of how some alleged meta metaphysical facts have some bearing on how you should set up a society or what you should do or something like that. So that will become most explicit at the end when we read that book. Um, okay, oh, see, I said I wouldn't go the whole time, but now I almost am, oh well. And yet, I actually listened to the lecture I gave last year. This is the first time I've ever done that because it was recorded. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything now that I didn't say last year. Why is it taking me longer? Um, anyway, so that's one thing I wanted to talk about. The other thing I wanted to mention at least briefly is this. So we don't include this in our course titles, but we could. Um, and other people who have the same courses might um, include these terms, British empiricist versus continental mental rationalist. I erased those lists of six names, but if they were still up there, I could point to the three rationalists and I could say Descartes was French and Spinoza was Dutch and Leibniz was German. So they were on the continent. That is Europe, right? The continent of Europe. Whereas um, our three people, Locke was English. Barclay actually was born in Ireland. So in some sense, he was Irish, which is not British, right? Ireland is not part of the island of Great Britain, but, um, uh, but he was Anglo-Irish. He was actually born in a castle in Ireland. He was, he was part of the occupying English nobility of Ireland. Um, he spent, although it was after he wrote the book we're reading, he spent a fair amount of his life in England actually. And towards the end of his life, he returned to Ireland and became a bishop in the Church of Ireland. The Church of Ireland is basically like 
the Angli was the Anglican Church trying to impose itself on Catholic Catholic Ireland, <laughs> right? So uh, Barclay, although in some sense he was Irish, in some maybe stronger sense was really English, and Hume was Scottish. So we have over here the, the three big names are continental, and over here the three big names are British, more or less. Um, why is that? Um, there's a lot of things I could say about that, but since I've somehow used up so much of my time, um, maybe, you know, boy, there's none of these things I want to leave out. So, I mean, but there's three things. I'll say two of them really quickly. One is that these people all wrote in French and Latin. Um, Spinoza wrote a little bit in Dutch. Leibniz wrote a little bit in German. But basically, the, the languages they wrote in, whatever language they spoke, were French and Latin, whereas these people all wrote in English. Right, the transition from Latin to the modern language happened earlier in Britain than it did on the continent, and it happened more completely. Hobbes still writes some stuff in Latin and some in English. After that, it's all English. So these people actually, I think, in their own minds, you know, classify themselves as as British. Whereas the other three probably would think of themselves as French, Dutch, and German, not as continental. Um, so at least for this course, there's like there's that kind of tie that they have with each other. But what specifically makes them empiricists? Like what connects that with being British? And I guess I'll just say, um, I think. There's one thing that goes back to medieval British philosophy. Without getting into the details, I will talk more about this later. Um, especially in the late Middle Ages, there was a huge debate about what's called nominalism versus realism about universals. It's not really the same debate as empiricism versus rationalism. I'll try to describe what it actually is a debate about when it comes up, but um, nominalism, so the important nominalists were British. Um, John Dunce Scotus, who was Scottish, that's why he's called Scotus, and William of Ockham, um, who was a more extreme nominalist, um, were both British, and the important realists were continental. It was a, basically a difference between Oxford and Paris even though people went back and forth between Oxford and Paris. Still, those are the main schools on each side. And there's some connection, I think, between nominalism and empiricism. And anyway, we'll see that Locke and Berkeley, at least, are both pretty strong nominalists. So that's a connection that already before the modern period, there was a difference between British and continental philosophy, which may be reflected in this split. But um, there's one other thing, which is um, Protestantism versus Catholicism. Now, of course, Protestantism versus Catholicism was a division within the continent, right? I mean, it was something people fought wars over for a century or two in Europe. But, um, but after um, Henry VIII took the Church of England out of the Catholic Church, which did I write a date down for that here? 15, around 1534. It didn't happen all at once, but it was about 1534. Um, after that, England became the main Protestant power and saw Catholicism as, the, as its political enemy, basically. And um, although there was some going forth, back and forth about this as well, um, you 
fairly early on, the Church of England set, uh, settled into the uh, a doctrine of being against transubstantiation. Transubstantiation means that when a priest celebrates the mass, the, um, the, the bread or wafer and the wine actually become, isn't exactly the right word for it, but actually are replaced by the body of Christ. The body of Christ is there, all of it. So like if mass is being celebrated in two different places at the same time, the entire body of Christ is present in two places at the same time. Of course, it doesn't look like the body of Christ. It still looks like a wafer. Um, so as Thomas Aquinas already asks about this, doesn't this make God a deceiver? So the answer is, you know, no, in general, our senses are reliable, but in this case, they're corrected by faith or, you know, something like that. Um, whereas Protestants on the whole uh, held that transubstantiation was, number one, had no basis in scripture, and number two was absurd or um, superstitious, um, not just false, but a bad doctrine. And a lot of people were burnt at the stake in England over this issue as kings went back and forth, kings and queens. Um, but as I said, eventually they settled down into the anti transubstantiation Well, you can see why this actually, this religious debate is related to epistemology and metaphysics. If you're an empiricist, if I give you something that not only looks like a wafer, but tastes like a wafer and feels like a wafer and smells like a wafer, that's the only source of knowledge you've got. It is a wafer. Right? So transubstantiation appears to be completely inconsistent with empiricism in this strong sense of empiricism. Rationalism. The rationalists had problems with this view as well. I mean, the truth is the Aristotelians had problems with it. Thomas Aquinas had to pull out all the stops to explain how this was possible according to Aristotelian metaphysics. But still, you know, if you start from the position that our senses in general are not reliable and that nevertheless, God is not a deceiver, you're in a better position to deal with this. So, um, and I wouldn't mention this except that I think we'll see this comes up every once in a while when you're reading the British empiricists. When they're reaching for an example of something that is utterly absurd and that you would only believe because you've been um, subjugated by some authority that forces you to believe absurd things, very often the example is believing that, this, that, uh, that a body can be in two places at the same time, right? And that when they say that, they're thinking, about transubstantiation. Okay, I was gonna say something about Locke's writing style and stuff like that, but I see that I am uh, out of time. So um, I guess I'll talk about it on Thursday after we've already read some. Um, okay, I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.